beloved brothers and sisters, what a joy it is to be with you on your first devotional. I'm glad to be here and I greet you with my affection and deep-seated love. I wrote some time ago a letter to a disbeliever. Much of what was said in that letter has been on my mind lately, and I wish to share the substance of the thoughts in this talk to you. With that explanation, you will understand the point of view assumed and the style in which it was given. Speaking to this young man who was battling with his thoughts, I said, Dear John, your resisting and arguing against the truths of the gospel have given me grave concern. I realize I cannot convince you against your will, but I know I can help you if you will only listen. If I may call to your attention some salient truths, and if you will listen with a prayer and a desire to know if what I say is true, I would not, even if I could, force your thinking, for free agency is the basic law of God, and each one must assume the responsibility for his own response. But certainly each of us must do his part in influencing for good those who might need some assistance. The Lord said unto Enoch, Behold, these thy brethren, they are the workmanship of my own hands, and I gave unto them their knowledge in the day I created them, and in the Garden of Eden gave I unto man his free agency. I've lain awake many long hours contemplating and after many fervent prayers on my bended knees, hopeful that I may say the right thing and that you would receive it in this humble spirit in which it is given. This true way of life is not a matter of opinion. There are absolute truths and relative truths. The rules of dietetics have changed many times in my lifetime. Many scientific findings have changed from year to year. The scientists taught for decades that the world was once a nebulous, molten mass cast off from the sun. And later, many scientists say it once was a whirl of dust which had solidified. There are many ideas that were... Thank you. that were advanced to the world which have been changed to meet the needs of the truth that has been discovered. There are relatives of relative truths, and there are these absolute truths, which are the same yesterday, today, and forever, never changing. These absolute truths are not altered by the opinions of men. As science has expanded our understanding of the physical world, certain accepted ideas of science have had to be abandoned in the interest of truth. Some of these seeming truths were stoutly maintained for centuries. The sincere searching is often on the threshold of truth, whereas revealed facts gives us certain absolute truths as a beginning point so that we may understand the nature of man and the purpose of his life. The earth is spherical. If all the some four billion people in the world think it flat, they are in error. That is an absolute truth, and all the arguing in the world will not change it. 
wing weights will not suspend themselves in the air, but when released will fall earthward. The law of gravity is an absolute truth. It never varies. Greater laws can overcome the lesser ones, but that does not change the undeniable truth. We learn about these absolute truths by being taught by the Spirit. These truths are independent in their spirit, spiritual sphere and are to be discovered spiritually, though they may be confirmed by experience and intellect. The great prophet Jacob said that the Spirit speaketh the truth. It speaketh of things as they really are and of things as they really will be. We need to be taught in order to understand life and who we are and we really are. God, our Heavenly Father, Elohim, lives. That is an absolute truth. All four billions of the children of men on the earth might be ignorant of him and his attributes and his powers, but he still lives. All the people on earth might deny him and disbelieve, but he lives in spite of them. And many have their own opinions, but he still lives, and his form, powers, and attributes do not change according to men's opinions. In short, there is no power in opinion alone in the matter of an absolute truth. He still lives, and Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Almighty, the Creator, the Master of the only true way of life, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The intellectual may rationalize him out of existence, and the unbeliever may scoff, but uh, Christ still lives and guides the destinies of his people. That's an absolute truth. There is no gainsaying. The watchmaker in Switzerland with materials at hand made the watch which was found in the sand in the California desert. The people who found the watch had never been to Switzerland, nor seen the watchmaker, nor seen the watch made. The watchmaker still existed, no matter the extent of their ignorance nor their experience. If the watch had a tongue, it might even lie and say, there is no watchmaker. What? That would not alter the truth. If men are really humble, they will realize that they discover, but they do not create. The gods organized the earth of materials at hand over which they had control and power. This truth is absolute. A million educated folk might speculate and determine in their minds that the earth came into being by chance. The truth remains. The earth was made by the gods, as was the watch by the watchmaker. Our opinions do not change it. The gods organized and gave life to man and placed him on the earth. This is absolute. It cannot be disproved. A million brilliant minds might conjecture otherwise, but it is still true. And having done all this for his children, the Christ mapped out a plan of life for man, a positive and absolute program whereby he might achieve, accomplish, and overcome and perfect himself. Again, these vital truths are not matters of opinion. If they were, then your opinion would be just as good as mine or better. But I give you these things not as my opinion. I give them to you as divine truths which are absolute. Someday you will see and feel and understand and perhaps tolerate yourself and even finally berate yourself for the long delay and waste of time. It is not a matter of if, 
It's a matter of when. Experience in one field does not automatically create expertise in another field. Expertise in religion comes from personal righteousness and from revelations. The Lord told the prophet Joseph Smith, all truth is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it. A geologist who has discovered truths about the structure of the earth may be oblivious to the truths as God has given us about the eternal nature of the family. If I can only clear this one thing, it will give us a basis on which to build. Man cannot discover God or his ways. We have mental feelings, of course. One must be governed by the laws which control the realm into which he is delving. To become a plumber, one must study the laws which govern. He must know stresses and strains, temperatures at which pipes will freeze, laws which govern steam, hot water, expansion, contracting, etc. One might know much about plumbing and be a complete failure in training children or getting along with men. One might be the best bookkeeper and yet not know anything of electricity. One might know much about buying and selling groceries and be absolutely ignorant of bridge building. One might be a great authority on the hydrogen bomb and yet know nothing of banking. One might be a noted theologian and yet the holy under untrained in watchmaking. One might be the author of the law of relativity and yet know nothing of the creator who originated every law. These are not matters of opinion, I repeat. They are absolute truths. These truths are available to every soul. Any intelligent man may learn what he wants to learn. He may acquire knowledge in any field. It requires much thought and effort. It takes more than a decade to get a high school diploma. It takes an additional four years for most people to get a college degree. It takes nearly a quarter century to become a great physician. Why, oh why, do people think they can fathom the most complex spiritual depths without the experimental and laboratory work accompanied by compliance with the laws that govern it. Absurd it is, but you will frequently find popular personalities who seem never to have lived a single law of God. Discouraging, discoursing in interviews on religion. How ridiculous for such persons to attempt to outline for the world a way of life. And yet, Many a financier, the politician, the college professor, or the owner of a gambling club thinks because he has risen above all his fellow men in his particular field. He knows everything in every field. One cannot know God nor understand his works or plans unless he follows the laws which govern. The spiritual realm, which is just as absolute as is the physical, cannot be understood by the physical. You do not learn to make electric generators in a seminary. Neither do you learn certain truths about spiritual things in a physics laboratory. You must go to the spiritual laboratory, use the facilities available there, and comply with these truths just as surely or more surely than the scientist knows the metals or the acids or other elements. <clears throat> Not matters little whether one is a plumber or a banker or a farmer, for these occupations are secondary. But it is most important what one knows and believes concerning his past and his future and what he does about it. When we were spiritual beings, fully organized and with abilities to think and study and understand with him, 
our Heavenly Father said to us, in effect, now, my beloved children, in your spirit state, you have progressed about as far as you can. To continue your development, you need physical bodies. I intend to provide a plan whereby you may continue your growth. As you know, one can grow only by overcoming. Now, said the Lord, we shall take of the elements at hand and organize them into an earth. Plant thereon vegetation and animal life and permit you to go, d go down on it. This will be your proving ground. We shall give you a rich earth, lavishly furnished for your benefit and enjoyment, and we shall see if you will prove the true and do the things which are asked of you. I will enter into a contract with you. If you will agree to exercise controls over desire and continue to grow towards perfection and godhood, by the plan which I shall provide, I will give to you a physical body of flesh and bones, a rich, productive earth with sun, water, forests, metals, soils, and all other necessities to feed and clothe and house you and give to you every enjoyment that the proper and, and which is proper and for your good. In addition to this, I will make it possible for you to eventually return to me as you perfect your life, overcoming obstacles and approaching perfection. To the above most generous offer, we, as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, responded with gratitude. We took our turns and came as the bodies were prepared by our earthly parents. We're now on trial on the proving ground. This also is an absolute truth. It cannot be disproved. It is an incontrovertible fact. If one can accept these unassailable truths, then he is ready to start his experimentation and his laboratory work. A few more salient facts which I shall not attempt at this moment to elaborate upon. Adam and Eve transgressed a law and were responsible for a change to come in their posterity, that of mortality. Could it have been the different food which made the change? Someone, somehow, blood, the life-giving element in our bodies, replaced the finer substance which coursed through their bodies before. We became mortal, subject to illness, pains, and even physical disillusion called death. But the spirit which is supreme in the dual man transcends the body. It does not decompose, but proceeds to the spirit world for future experience with the assurance that after sufficient preparation there, a reunion will take place where the spirit will be housed in a remodeled body of flesh and bones eternally, this time never to be dissolved since there will be no blood to disintegrate and cause trouble. A finer substance will t give life to the body and will render it immortal. This resurrection referred to is the work of Jesus Christ, the Savior, who became who, because he was both mortal, son of Mary, and divine, son of God, he was able to overcome the powers governing the flesh. He actually gave his life and literally took it up again as the first fruits to be followed by every soul that has ever lived. He gave his life being a God. No one could take it from him. He had developed through his perfection in overcoming all things and power to take up his life again. Death was his last enemy, and he overcame even that and established the resurrection. This is an absolute truth. All the theorists in the world cannot disprove it. It is a fact. 
Before his crucifixion, the Savior recognized the absolute necessity for an organization of persons duly empowered to carry on his work. He teach his plan to the world and, per and persuade people to follow the eternal program. He therefore organized his church among his faithful followers with apostles, prophets, and other officials to give his people guidance. He sent those officials into all the world to teach his truths, but without using force. For the, basis, the basic law of this world is free agency. Certainly a man or a woman may use his own agency in doing what he pleases, but they cannot ever evade the penalties that might come by reason of any error they would make. He set up his program of organization, fully gave the government governing principles and doctrines, delegated his full authority to his officers to teach and perform ordinances. He ignored all the multitudinous religious organizations then extant and all their non-man-made doctrines and philosophies and set up his own divine plan. This is true. If all the proponents of the isms on all the continents disbelieve it, it is still true, an absolute truth. Even before he went to Calvary, he knew that his young and pitifully small organization would not long resist the wolves of antagonistic philosophies and the terrific persecutions which would come. But he left some stalwart apostles and others to guide and build the kingdom. The Savior knew beyond doubt that an apostasy would come. It did. Persecution was intolerable. The apostles said to have suffered martyrs' deaths. Innumerable others, both priesthood and laity, suffered unbelievable tortures. The church was uprooted and destroyed almost by physical horrors and finally through pagan rulers who were not truly converted Christian to Christianity was accepted and made popular. The pagan superstitions, in order to do so and to get the nations to accept it, the pagan superstitions and doctrines were superimposed upon the Christian doctrines and intermingled until the doctrines and ordinances established by the Christ were changed and diluted so that they had only a faint resemblance to the truth. With the authorized servants martyred and both author authority and doctrines gone, the world went into its spiritual tailspin and into the dark ages wherein the true understanding of God and his plan was not upon the earth when gross darkness enveloped the people, when there was little progress even in material things and almost a complete void spiritually. The apostasy is a certainty. There is no room for doubt. God's church was lost for the moment, as it had been through many centuries in the past. The true plan of life was placed upon the earth in the beginning, when it was given to Adam. After a few generations, the descendants of Adam went the way of the world, and most of the earth's children lost the truth and the knowledge of God and of the gospel. One descendant of Adam Enoch established good communications again with God and established the truths again upon the earth. But only comparatively few of the inhabitants listened and accepted. Hence another great apostasy from the truth. The people of the world became so wicked that they were literally drowned and washed off the earth. But Noah, a righteous prophet, he reestablished administration and communication with the Lord and carried on the work of the Lord, but only for a brief period, for weak mortal man permitted 
the flesh to control the spirit again. And another great apostasy took place. And most of the people were without a knowledge and understanding of God. Time passed, idolatry prevailed, wickedness increased. But finally the Lord sent us a super spirit to earth, born the son of terror. Though all the earth were apostate, having turned to the worship of idols, to murder, adultery, drunkenness, bribery, and all manner of evil, this child, Abraham, grew up with sufficient power and goodness to cause the heavens to open again, and they revealed again to him the truths. I am writing all these truths I am writing about. Abraham spent a glorious life teaching righteousness and to his own numerous posterity and to others. As in all other dispensations, the majority went foul, ignored the true way, and followed the way of the Lord, of the world. Then the Savior was born in Judea, ushering in another dispensation. He reestablished his truths on the earth, the priesthood, the power, the organization, the knowledge to save and exalt men. But as stated earlier, this lasted only a few generations and was gone again. Now with the doctrines perverted, the priesthood gone, the organization corrupted, and the knowledge lost, there must come another awakening. And as the prophet Daniel prophesied, Millennia ago, there finally came a day when another restoration should come, this time never to be lost. We have that promise now that even though individuals may fall, the church and the gospel is here to stay, and all the powers of the earth and hell cannot perfect total apostasy again. This much needed restoration came through the prophet Joseph Smith, who followed in the march of the prophets Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This, and this is the church organization through revelation by the Savior. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it is organized by revelation from Jesus Christ. It was given full and complete organization, full and complete authority, full and complete plans and programs. This restoration was preceded by a long period of preparation. The pilgrims and other Europeans were inspired to find this American haven of refuge. And thus people this land with honest and God-fearing people. Washington and his fellows were inspired to revolt from England and bring politician, bring political liberty to this land, carrying also the more valuable treasure of religious liberty so that the soil might be prepared for the seed of the truth when it should again be sown. So in the early 19th century, the marvelous work and a wonder was reintroduced into the world. The youthful prophet who had not been contaminated with the sins of the world, whose mind had not been prejudiced by false philosophies of men, was the instrument of the restoration. He, as in all of the other dispensations, and especially the one preceding it, when Jesus personally came to restore, the little seed of truth had to light a mountain of, had to fight a mountain of falsehood. Church organization made by men without claim to divinity or revelation were everywhere in abundance. The corrupted doctrines of former centuries were all there. Religious confusion reigned, and most of the world opposed bitterly and cried false prophet at the first mention of the restored truth. The tiny organization began in 1830 with six members. It has had phenomenal growth. 
to some four billion, four million in that short period. It is here to stay. This Church of Jesus Christ, named, nicknamed Mormon, is the only true and living church which is fully recognized by God, the only one properly organized with the authority to perform for him, and the only one with a total and comprehensive and true program which will carry men to powers unbelievable and to realms incredible. This is an absolute truth. It cannot be disproved. It is as true as the near spherical shape of the earth, and as gravity, and as true as the shining of the sun, as positive as the truth that we live. Most of the world disbelieve it. Ministers attempt to disprove it. Intellectuals think to rationalize it out of existence. But when all the people of the world are dead and the ministers and priests are ashes and the highly trained are moldering in their graves, the truth will go forward. The church will continue triumphant and the gospel will still be true. The Lord has defined truth as being a knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come. God's existence is a reality. Immortality is a reality. These realities won't go away simply because we have different opinions about them. These realities will not be dissolved just because some have doubts about them. Opinions, of course, there is a difference of opinion. But again, opinion cannot change laws or absolute truths. Opinions will never make the earth to be flat, the sun to dim its light, and God to die, or the Savior to cease being the Son of God. Now it is a good question which has been asked by millions since Joseph Smith phrased it. How am I to know which of all, if any, of the organizations is authentic? divine and recognized by the Lord. He is given the key. You may know. You need not be in doubt. Follow the prescribed procedures and you may have an absolute knowledge that these things are absolute truths. The, necessity, the necessary procedure is study, think, pray, and do. Revelation is the key. God will make it known to you when you have capitulated and have become humble and receptive, having dropped all pride of your mental stature, having acknowledged before God your confusion, and having subjected your egotism, and having surrendered yourself to the teaching of the Holy Spirit, you are ready to begin to learn with the preoccupation with uh, preconceived religious notions stubbornly held, one is not teachable. The Lord has promised repeatedly that he will give you a knowledge of spiritual things when you have placed yourself in a proper frame of mind. He has counseled us to seek, ask, and search diligently. These innumerable promise, promises are epitomized in the following of Moroni, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know the truth of all things. What a promise, how extravagant, how wonderful. May I repeat, the time will come when there will be a surrender of every person who has ever lived on this earth, who is now living, or who ever will live on this earth, and it will be an unforced surrender, an unconditional surrender. When will it be for you? Today? It, uh, in 20 years, 200 years, 2,000 or a million? When? Again, I say to you, John, if you will capitulate to the great truth, it is when, for I know that you cannot indefinitely resist the power and pressures of truth. 
Why not now? Much time has been lost. The years ahead can be far more glorious for you than any years in the past. How foolish would be the enslaved Israelites who were born in slavery and had never known anything but slavery to say to himself, this is life. There is nothing better than this. Here I get my belly full daily and a fair space in which to sleep. How short-sighted he would be to prefer such status when he is told that across the sea and across the desert, a promised land awaits where he can be free, well-fed, master of his own destinies, with a leisure, culture, growth, and all one's heart could rightfully desire. What does it matter? What is the difference between light and darkness, growing and shriveling, a giant and a pygmy, freedom and slavery, electricity and one and the one day, life and death? Now with great humility I send this message to you, John, and to all others who sh may hear it with a prayer in my heart that you will not cast it aside but that you will think it through and ponder about it as you pray about it. There must be an open mind, a sincere heart, a desire, a reaching. The assurance will definitely come to you, but not unless you make an effort. I bear testimony to you that this is true. I know it. I send to you a solemn warning, and when you stand before the judgment bar, in the not too far distant future, you will know then that I speak the truth and your eternal welfare was in mind. Please remember that I have tried to bring this matter to your attention with such force that it would impress you. The true and living church and its members and representatives stand ready to provoke to provide answers to any questions. And I promise you faithfully that if you will study and pray, keeping your mind open, that you will receive the light and it will be to you as the dawning of a new day, having gone through the night of darkness. Again, I offer the assistance of the church, but I will not push this matter upon you nor force it. You are mature, and you have a good mind, and you have a strong background, and the seeds of truth were sown in your life, in your youth. All the powers of earth and heaven cannot bring this knowledge to you. It cannot be hoped for nor purchased. It must come by a careful, honest, and sincere investigation. The church stands ready to furnish such assistance as you may require. You cannot cast off this appeal and warning without grave responsibility. You will have to answer to your creator if you ignore it, just as I would have to answer if I ignored it. I am doing my best to present it. I know that this is the only complete, divine, eternal program which is recognized and approved of God. Joseph Smith went into the grove, spent a long time on his knees, and came out with a knowledge of the divinity of Elohim and his son Jesus Christ, such a conviction that he went voluntarily to his martyrdom rather than to deny it. Paul, on his way to Damascus, saw a glorious personage and heard his voice, and yet a after even these unusual manifestations, Paul prayed so that he could know beyond the shadow of a doubt of the divinity of Jesus Christ and of his Father and his eternal program. The gospel, he finally knew it so positively that he gave the balance of his life teaching it. He was nearly stoned to death and raised again. He suffered hunger, thirst, persecutions, and then knowing full well that his life would be taken, he went gloriously to his death, thus giving not only his energy, time, earning capacity, but his life 
very life for the cause. Paul knew more about the healings and saving truths that were necessary for the welfare of human souls than all of the sages and the doctors of his time or this time. He knew that God lived, Jesus was the Christ, and the gospel was a way of eternal life, mortal and immortal, never-ending, and that the rewards of eternities were worth the sacrifice of or comforts of this life. You may know, as did Joseph Smith, Paul, Peter, and other number of great contemporaries, this is not another church, this is the church. This is not another gospel or philosophy. This is the church and gospel of Jesus Christ. He lives. Our Father lives. His Son lives. I am so sure of this that I am willing to bear witness of it with the last effort of my tongue and lips. I am willing to go into eternity and face my God with this testimony on my lips of these truths, I bear witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.